What's up, world? This episode of Power Sprite, Power Spike, there we go, <laughs> is brought to you by Trolley Sour Bright Crawlers. The multi-flavored sour gummy worms, I want nothing more than for you to chew their delicious sour heads and bodies into pieces. Thank you, Trolley. Uh, so far, all of you at home have let us know across uh, our YouTube comments, uh, over in the Twitch chat, in stream, uh, how much uh, you've helped support and uh, enjoyed Trolley and keep doing it because they love that and we appreciate Trolley come and support us. So it, it's all synergetic here. Uh, thank you all for supporting us and thank you to Trolley for uh, supporting this episode of Power Spike. Of uh, Sour Bright. <laughs> yeah, this episode of Sour Bright <laughs> brought to you by Power. We'll call, it pa we'll call it Power Bright moving forward. Just just the entire show. We're not going to um, just go with Sour Bright. Might as well just, <laughs> just fully, might as well. Uh, yeah, fully, fully convert it. We changed all our colors. We have the trolley logo. Yeah, we might as well just fully commit at this point in time. I even I changed my background color to match the the trolley pink. You know, we're all the synergy's high. I, I, this looks like a color of the blueberry. What is it? Strawberry grape. There it is. Uh, you were saying earlier before we started, Dom, um, <laughs> you can't not eat them. What's going on, man? <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I, the thing is, I thought that like I wasn't going to eat that many of them going into it because I'm like, I'm not really a candy person. But it is like the perfect candy because it's not overbearing. Normally when you eat too much yeah. candy, it's like too sweet, right? So you just end up, you're like, ah, oh, you feel like a little like disgusted at a point. But when it's like a sour candy, it's like like every single time that you eat one, you're like, oh, you know, like that was like two different things. Like then you go back again. Oh, I kind of want the sour flavor. Then you want the sweet flavor. So you just keep on eating them, man. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm just generally more of a, a savory snack person, but I just love these so much. I love these ones. I agree with Dom. They're not cloyingly sweet, which really helps. It, it's nostalgia as well for me. Like I'm like I'm just like a little kid at baseball practice before I was banned twice by Riot. Just like, <laughs> from, were you practice. ever banned from baseball? <laughs> no, I've never been banned from like anything my entire life besides for League of Legends, like in accounts, and then from my career twice. I've never got a Twitch. I've never even got like a. I, I got one warning on Twitch one time by accident um, because I uh, showed. Um, a uh, video of freak somebody baited me they had me you know they're, they're like oh listen to this freak video so it was like him talking about patch notes and then there's one time where he tabs and they put in hentai into where he tabs to make it look oh, like he tabbed to hentai no. <laughs> so it's like it's like the perfect way to bait me because i always react to like patch notes and stuff and like it's like oh freak said something stupid like i got my clips ready i'm ready to play and then it was just like it was just like league of legends hentai all over my screen i just turned it off immediately nice um, classic, classic you never you never got suspended from school or either one of you no i never got no, in trouble I, I look i was a great student at school the uh, like dom the only time i've ever gotten in trouble with is with riot games it's almost like they're the problem and not the people who work with them i don't think anyone would ever guess they had the chance to win multiple bags of trolley gummy worms that <laughs> out of the three of us i was the only one that gets suspended from school i got into wow. two fights yeah you got into fights? Wait, what, what, fight. where were you at this point? Was this in Virginia? Or? Yeah, it was in Virginia. Um, it was seventh grade or eighth grade, eighth grade Spanish class. And it was like with one of my like best buds. And um, he just took my eraser. He said, give it back. And he said, say it in Spanish. And I didn't know how to say it in Spanish. I said, just give me the eraser back. He said, fucking make me. And I don't know what was going on that day. But the boy stood up and just, wow, like right, right in his chest. And he fell over in the chair. And he was wearing, he was wearing Tim's at the time. And so he was trying to like kick upwards. And then afterwards, our teacher, like this little Spanish lady, like was like jumping on us. Like it was like wrestling <laughs> jump on me because I was crushing them. Everyone else is like watching no phones. Right. Because this wasn't we didn't have phones at that time. Yep. And they just made us sit outside the room. And afterwards, we're laughing about it. And then we were like, I wonder how upset our parents are going to be. Fucking 80s like, were crazy, man. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> But yeah, um, you know what? We'll get you banned from Trolley Gummy Worms. So make sure to go get them and continue to support us here at Power Spike or uh, Sour Spike. Someone came up with that one. I just want to say That's Twitch good. chat came up with that one. Uh, all all right. right. Also, we have announcements for this week on the LFN Network. So the Culture Channel has now started a new show with me, Thorne, and Richard Lewis called Foreplay, which is less erotic <laughs> than you might be led to believe from the day. <laughs> 
they review the Adam 22 of uh, verse uh, the Adam 22 video is going to be the first thing that they review as film. <laughs> I, we're going to go back to your to your lol hentai actually Dom. Um, yeah. but yeah, uh, just type uh, in freak hentai on Twitter and you can probably find uh, it pretty please, easy. Oh, no, please, no, no, no. Don't do that. The okay, phrase freak hentai is too much. Please do not do draw that, that and send it to Dom. <laughs> Guys, I am begging you not to draw freak hentai and send it to Dom. <laughs> Please. Do not do that on Twitter. <laughs> if you don't draw a free Kentai and send it to Dom on all the God social media damn. platforms, do not do it. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, hey, you're going to continue to tell us about the new yeah, show. The show. So, the show is we watch four movies. Uh, this month's theme is cosmic horror, and we go through them. We just today, uh, as of the recording of this video, so if you're watching it tomorrow, it'll be yesterday. Release the thing. It's on Last Free Nation Culture on YouTube, all podcast platforms as well. That goes alongside my show with Doa, Nerd Legion. We're talking about The Witcher this week. And I know we discussed this on this show. We will, we actually opened up the Last Free Nation Sports channel, Last Free Nation Sports on social media and on YouTube. And Maui Snake and Thorin are premiering their basketball show, Good. Banter Give and Go, tomorrow. So we are going to start populating these channels with more and more content. There you go, guys. It's, it's all coming together. How many shows can we make? That's the question. I'm doing six now. I don't even know how many Thorin's on. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot for both of you. Uh, way to go and congrats and for all of you that are interested make sure to go check it on out and do the same thing that you do with our main lfn channel uh go uh, subscribe to the channel so you get the updates and at least give it a good shake give it a good shake see if this is the format that you like it and and if not let us know in the comments below because these shows are for you it's for our homies here that wanted to hear us talk about nerd culture that wanted to hear us talk about sports this is what it's about so make sure to give the feedback there it may or may not be taken, but I mean, most of the time. We're working our way. We're working our way. And next up will be general gaming at some point in time. That's that's the, the, the new frontier that will open up once we start to populate the sports and culture channel just a little bit more down the road. So, yeah, very fun. Well, as we always do, when there are matches from the European League, we'll cover the matches that we just saw and start in Europe with our quick reactions to this group stage uh matches started back on friday thursday thursday friday saturday it's 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 been friday. Uh, thir friday. saturday thursday. for what for which one for lec yeah it's just saturday saturday sunday monday right yeah thursday, saturday sunday, sunday. it's been three series one two one two three four i thought it's been four series oh, okay whatever they had matches There's earlier for like the six, group stage so two a day got it got it got it got it we had the two a days earlier uh for all three days so we had six matches done and dusted already so we've got our winner's bracket already filled on out with g2 and excel moving on through and the loser's brackets we're about to end some seasons y'all uh and it might be heretics but let's see how we got there hopefully i know that's what you want it almost looked like not they won game one renekton yep. looked good not not quite yeah and then evie started cooking on the <laughs> orange and then it was over for everyone. Like, we were watching that game. We had Whippo in the call, and like we were talking about like how in this game, all he needs to do is just scale versus the Renekton. Just match the Renekton, go like 10 CS down, and just sit in your lane, catch wave, catch wave, catch wave, you eventually outscale. And then he just started TPing around the map, just doing like random shit. And then at 26 minutes, he had like 130 CS. He was he was five CS a minute, or five CS uh yeah, five CS a minute. It was just fucking really, really tough to watch, which, you know, is par for the course with Evie. He once again ruined, uh, you know, another series. He's ruined their chances of you know, <laughs> make, making. I mean, look, they, they get another shot for this verse. Yeah. Uh, they, get, they get another shot to potentially make it through. But I think this team is just cooked. Like the top laner is just too bad. I just love watching this team because it's a battle between the rest of the team and Evie every single time. <laughs> and yep. I sit there, you get your bucket of popcorn and you just sit there and you wait for Evie to inevitably throw these games. It was also a bad matchup in the same way. I'm sure that we'll talk about how G2 is a bad matchup for BDS. I think BDS is a bad matchup for heretics and this is why when we talked about it as our, our LFN match of the week last week that we picked BDS to win, even though they were uh, an odds underdog, just because 
you know, the, the last time these two teams met, it was Agresivo who was in. The thing about this matchup is like, if you know you can hard win in the top lane with Adam or Adam can create a lot of pressure, that plays to BDS's strengths where they can just sort of take dragons for free and then run Adam down to the dragon and then force you to fight at, you know, third, fourth dragon. And so, you know, this really is hard, I think, for heretics to deal with. And yes, they won game number one, but part of that was definitely VTO getting the Kaisa, which I think was really intelligently banned for the rest of the series. And the rise of Kaisa in this meta, like more and more top teams are realizing that Kaisa really is blue side first pick. We need to get this champion. She's just to explain why uh, she's incredibly first off. Benefits from Static Shiv hugely, even with the nerfs to, to Static Shiv on 13.13, uh, 13, um, because it actually gives her increased wave clear, and she was already an excellent duelist, so she actually does have split push pressure at times, or can be sent alone to solo people out in lanes and then quickly push the wave. You can itemize multiple different ways on her, depending on how the rest of your composition shakes out, so you don't actually have to, you know commit to a, a, a certain level of itemization or a certain path of itemization, even though the hybrid AP build is probably overall the strongest, because especially at three, four items, her W becomes just completely oppressive. Um, she can be flexed, obviously, between mid and AD carry. And I think really what the biggest thing about her is, is because late game, her poke uh, becomes really, really brutal. And she controls the pace of team fights super well, because if you actually are able to ult into the backline. You can basically decide when you're going to engage after having multiple instances of poke, right? And if you have an if you have a if you have a stopwatch on you, then you can actually kind of function as a primary engage while assassinating the other team's AD carry. Um, and she does Baron super fast. So really, what's not to like about this champion right now? She is dumb strong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing that I can think of is like there isn't a dash an immediate dash it's only after there's a cc or the proc on there but like kais has been uh pretty dominant and a, a a premier champ leading the way i know a lot of people in the chat and people have been saying it in comments before like why don't you just bench evy why don't you just go with another rookie go with anyone else you're it's it's too it's too late in the season for that like this is it this is who you're rolling with like you, you've got evy there you made your bed now you gotta lay in it peter dunn or it was probably before peter dunn but you know <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they have a chance to to drop him in between splits. I just think it's so ridiculous. You Think about how much improvement you've seen from Evie from the beginning of the split. He's like literally the same player as he was back in winter. And this just, I mean, to me, it's just, it's so tough to watch him make the same mistakes over and over again. And I'm not, I, I'm sure that the people on his team like know what mistakes he's making. He just doesn't have the vision in game to like be able to understand what to do. He doesn't have the game knowledge to be able to figure out what his job is in, in, in different games. So it's, it's really tough to watch, um, to watch Evie. And I think that now like this patch, it, it should be pretty hard for them. So heretics have, I guess the advantage that now like Ziggs is coming into the bot lane, like that's good for Flockhead. But in general, they were able to get away with playing enchanters before for Mirsa, which it seems like he is just better at things like Yumi. He's probably one of the better Yumi players. I know that everyone says Yumi takes, no skill, but like he was one of the better Yumi players in, in Europe. Milio was obviously really strong on 1311. And now if you look at the meta, it's a bunch of Nautilus. It's a bunch of Rel. It's a bunch of Rakan, um, Braum. And these champions he's just not as proficient at. So they don't really win bot. And Evie is rarely going to win top. So you just pretty much have to rely on Yankos and Video carrying like the entire game, which doesn't seem that realistic for them in, in a lot of the games. So uh, it's just very hard for this team to succeed. I wouldn't be surprised if they just drop um drop out in the uh, next best of three they have to play cool. yeah i think the you know this is one of the the issues with the lec format is because sometimes they skip patches and what we've seen to dom's point is a pretty large meta shift because it, it, it basically when you start to see the shift from enchanter to engage supports it also changes so much of the the rest of the way that you draft because all of a sudden it can open up for example, potentially more carry junglers, if if you can play those. Um, we've seen a lot of engage mid laners over the last few months. So think about, you know, uh, Everfrost mid laners or Annie, right? Or even Crown Azir, right? And so when when you have your engage coming from a different spot on the roster, 
it starts to move the way the rest of the game plays. We've also seen a lot more AD uh, mid laners, which is also then creating AP junglers or zigs in the bot lane as well. So when you when you move away from the enchanters, it can really affect a, the way a lot of other players play and which players need to be strong, right? I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why I anticipate D plus will do better in this meta is because it, it opens up Canyon quite a bit. One more uh, series that I guess the other side of the bracket that we just didn't expect SK taking down Fnatic, Excel taking down Mad Lions. And how about this? We got ourselves a little bit of a Cinderella story happening in the LEC. Excel going 10th and 10th are now one series away from gaining enough championship points to at least give them a chance to be in the gauntlet, the summer championship for uh, the uh, overall round, which would knock out vitality vitality still currently like sitting on their hands but they it's are their not dumb. they're not winning versus g2 i'm telling you that like they yeah, need yeah, some, yeah, a yeah, massive yeah. draft gap to win versus g2 <laughs> g2 is like way better than every team in europe and then also yeah. that side of the bracket is definitely the weaker side um right now with how fanatic performed i mean that side of the bracket is, is way easier um, I think that a lot of what XL is is doing is they're getting by um, off draft gap. Like, for example, in the first game this series, you look at their comp and my God, they have everything that they want. They somehow end up with like the JS Kaisa. They just have a million range on the enemy team. And it's very hard for, for other teams to play into that. It feels like they're draft gapping. I thought game number two was not a great draft. That was probably their only bad draft of both the best of threes they played. Um, I thought they could have just ran back what they did before it's really confusing to me that they played kaisa did really well with it and in the next game they banded on blue side um yeah. but overall you see they have like some depth to what they're willing to play um they're able to catch people off guard for example they banned leblanc on blue side first two games game number three they actually play it themselves so that's uh that shows that they're like those bands aren't as locked as people would perceive normally if you see a blue blue side kaisa or blue side leblanc ban you'll think that this guy just doesn't play LeBlanc. The team just doesn't play it, but they showed that they were willing to play it, which gives them um, yeah, some advantage when it comes to playing best of fives. But I think that in general, they just don't have like the macro to compete with the top teams. I mean, even in the games they're winning, you see Peach getting caught. You see just like the random picks that happen. Uh, how how dare you speak about Peach after his lease in his phenomenal dominant Lee Sin game versus Mad Lions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his Lee Sin was 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 pretty good. It was it was pretty good. I mean, he got gifted a free triple kill, but you know, it, it, he he did work in that game. I think the the problem is that like if they played a lot of Lee Sin, they're not going to be getting good matchups for Lee Sin, especially versus G2. Like he's going to be playing into all these really annoying junglers that you can tell that Yike is really comfortable on. He's comfortable on the Rel, he's comfortable on the Ivern. Um, and I think that once they match a team that is like that out of the macro wise, even if they do outdraft, they're just going to get caught in some type of 4v5 situation or they're going to be late on a TP. There's going to be some amount of disconnect. G2 will pressure them enough. There'll be some disconnect. They'll just lose you the entire game. So I think I think SK is also just kind of fraudulent. So that's why I'm not reading too much into the wins, uh, like the win against Fnatic or like XL's win against them. Um, or honestly, SK's win into Fnatic because I think Fnatic. Look, here's another symptom of of doing like a multi patch skip. Some teams just going to have a bad meta read, and I think Fnatic really struggled. Also, Humanoid was kind of bad, but I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but I think with SK, they had a good meta read. This was the team that really was prioritizing Kaisa in the drafts. I mean, we've seen this from some of the top teams in the world right now. KT has literally played Kaisa in 10 out of the their last 10 games and they just keep first picking it because I think they realize sooner than everybody else what this champion can do for them and as long as you have a good Kaisa player on your roster and because SK for this year has been relying a lot on Exa kicks carries uh it makes sense for them to prioritize this pick now the other thing that they've done is Markun has been good at Poppy because Notably, he sits some really important ults in order to secure objectives. But when they don't have Kaisa and they don't have Poppy, they don't look good. Um, so I don't think that that SK really. I think they've been kind of solved at this point in time. And credit to Excel, but I. It's not that anything about Excel has particularly struck me as remarkable. Clearly, like Odo Omne is playing better than he has at, at earlier points in the season, but Peach still has issues, particularly on tanks 
and not really being able to perform that well or getting randomly picked off. And we haven't seen, you know, mega individual performances. To their credit, they've had some good flanks. I think they've had some good setups on team fights. They're solid fundamentally, but I don't think they're going to have the the extra firepower or, as Don says, the macro finesse that we see from a team like G2. I, I do want to bring up two things. One, you, you, Dom, you, you said it earlier with the Kaisa pick. It was in the interview after the, the post-match interview with Abadage. That was actually one of my favorite interviews from the LEC this year. You could see he talked about 100 Thieves or he, well, his last team and why he went to Excel and it was a very good interview, knowing that I've interviewed him before, and he isn't always the most uh, articulate. And I didn't think that the questions were all that great, but he did a great job explaining the difficulties, and it felt like a heartwarming interview there. So if you want to go feel good, you can go watch that post-game interview uh, with Abadage after the win. Uh, fuck, and I forgot my second point. I just remember that one. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, well... It'll come back later, and hopefully we haven't gone too, too far away from Excel possibly making it on in. Oh, okay. That's what it was. It was the math on what needs to happen so that Vitality is out. So Vitality uh, yeah. is currently sitting in you know the clubhouse. They are six. The teams that can catch him are Excel, Fnatic, and Heretics, which all theoretically could. And if all three make it on through, one of them will, and then Excel is out. They need to fit. Excel needs to finish second. Fnatic or Heretics need to win this series and get third. If they get third, they're in, in uh, Vitality's out. And it just kind of feels like whoever gets that spot, if it's Vitality, do you, do you trust in them turning it around? Or would you rather get one of the bottom teams here that has some firepower that could possibly knock someone off? Can I pick none of them? Sure. <laughs> I guess that's the it's, case. It's literally I'd, just... rather, I'd rather pick Fnatic. I'd rather pick Fnatic. Because then you have SK and Koi in front of them, right? You have SK and Koi. This is for the fourth spot. So isn't, isn't that how that works, right? It would be, who do you want to go as the fourth team in LEC? There's my question. Uh, I don't want anyone to go. I mean, I, I guess BDS. <laughs> You're Mad, already out Mad on again. Fnatic? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think. I, I mean, I think they suck. But like, like overall, G two is just yeah, way yeah. better than everyone else. So, I would say, I, I would probably say G two fanatic, mad and BDS. That's fair. all right. All right. So fanatic is so fanatic for sure. Run. They they suck. Like I can tell you with confidence. I've I've watched enough. All right. We'll, we'll definitely get to fanatic sucking a little bit. Those were uh, your updates there again. The G2 and XL match will the winner will go straight to the finals. The loser will go to the third place match. So uh, it, it just felt like a really cool storyline here that Excel has been able to go from 10th to 10th and now finding themselves one series away from, you know, turning their fortunes around in this new split. So cool, cool little caveat and wrinkle and end result from the new format that the LEC has brought this season. All right, let's move to uh, our first full segment i guess our second full segment here of uh this week's show it's a, a chat about the lck we're going to korea and we've had dominant players throughout the years in korea and there's been one player who's just been so dang good but just hasn't been able to show it and we've got ourselves our first tough to swallow it's keen as the lck mvp question mark let's see Monty. All right. So here it is. Wolf gave me some alarming news, which is that he believes that most people in the LCK think Pays is the front runner for MVP, which is just an absolutely ridiculous proposition. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Pace, it should be Caria. <laughs> is, oh, no. no. He's not is the best Pace, in the world? Okay, no. Never mind. Is Pays good? Yes, he is. Does Pays deserve to be rookie of the of the year? Yes, he does. Is Gen G currently undefeated in first place? Yes, they are. But the question for MVP is whether Pays could, is, is he really the most valuable player in the entire league? Is he even the best <laughs> AD carry in the entire league is a very no, reasonable he's question. He's not, exactly. Uh, could other another player do Pays' job? 
That is that is the crux of this question. And when we look at him statistically, he's not outstanding statistically by any means, especially compared to other top 80 carries, particularly Viper, who continues to be one of, if not the only hard carry force on Hobmo Life, uh, a team that actually is pretty deep into the playoff race at this point in time and continues to get better. Uh, is he even as good as Gumiyushi, who has probably been the most consistent player for T1 overall this split and has been some of the only reasons they've been able to hold on into late game scenarios versus other teams, especially in Faker, Faker's absence. It, you know, is he even as good as aiming who has better laning stats than him and has been more of a hyper carry threat in terms of like damage, DPM and damage percentage in the late game? And so for me, I really struggle. And so we need to start the Keen for MVP campaign here because he cannot be robbed of this. And the reason why it's Keen is because without Keen, KT completely falls apart. And Keen has been definitively the best top laner for this entire split. He has been incredibly versatile in terms of his champion pool. He has been really leading the pro meta in terms of bringing certain counter picks like Quinn against Renekton into professional play this year. And he's won all of his Quinn games, which can be very difficult, especially when you have to team fight sometimes with Quinn in the late game, which can be challenging. And he does it even when he's behind on Quinn, which is even crazier as we saw this past week. He's the only good Malphite player within the entirety of the LCK. You basically cannot give him Jax or he will completely dominate games. You can't give him Renekton or he will completely dominate games. And so he's able to absorb either bans or flat out blind picks and still perform at an extraordinarily high level. Keen has been definitively the best player in the LCK for, su for summer, and it is slander to consider pays or another player as MVP of the LCK. And we cannot allow this to go through where people are going to pick pays just because he's on the best team when he has his job has basically been do okay in lane and then be a janitor in team fights, which many other AD carries in the LCK are capable of doing. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, before I join this keen pain, I have a couple of key questions here. Uh, one, do you know what other top laners have the same amount of pog points as he does? Oh, it's going to be like it's Doran, Doran or some bullshit. Uh, <laughs> Doran doesn't have the same. He has more. He's more, yes. But uh, there is a, another top laner that has the same amount as him. Actually, there's two more. Is it going to be Morgan? It's not no, Morgan. Doodoo, probably one of them. Doodoo, that's right. Of Doodoo is actually low key creeps. good. Okay. Doodoo is actually low key good. He's okay. he's elo he hell. Okay. Name change. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> ironic, Dom. Ah. Yeah. No, it's I see that. And and of course, Dom's favorite, uh, Zeus, has uh, the same amount. They is that name had... ironic too? Because he's like named after a Greek god, but he's actually kind of mid. I'm trying to just figure out how. It... <laughs> How so, works. uh, we need we need to solve it's, it's, that one. It's here. because he's actually here's here it is, Dom. It's because he identifies with the god of lightning because he gets clapped like thunder at international. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, <laughs> all right. Like that one. I, we're, I hey, thought we were going somewhere with LCK Jace. Too. He like, <laughs> not even just internationals. He's next level. That guy actually. He's he's domestic clappings. Um. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. Uh, the other thing is, there is like a, a shady... Uh, I went to the 100 Thieves viewing party for Valorant yesterday, and I was talking with uh, another team owner, and there was a shady guy that used to be in esports, not in esports anymore, now running for office. He's running for our, like state elected official in, in a state. And the thing is, with campaigns, because it was very simple, but it made sense, they have principles that they put their campaign on. So if we are trying to join the Keen Pain and we're like, you're going to join the Keen Pain with us, y'all, and make Keen the MVP despite having half the amount of player of the game points as Canyon and well, not as many as That's because D plus only wins when Canyon pops off. This is true. Showmaker only has four. <laughs> uh, Canyon has 10. Um, what also, are when the Canyon pops blocks? off, it's like stupid impressive. So that's why. What are the building blocks that we are using here for the keen pain? Let, let's let's say three things to go on the keen pain. Okay, so definitively and inarguably the best top laner within the LCK right now. 
You can just argue right here with player of the game point. But player no, of the can't. game is such a bad argument because player yeah. of the game is like, like <laughs> let's say, let's say I just play a super coin flip style and I like completely in my team the game 80% of the Canyon. time. But then this is what Canyon is number one in player of the game, but he's been yeah, hilariously so, inconsistent. Wait, you so like that's my whole point. What, so you, yeah, exactly. player of the game and guys, like, you don't get oh. like you don't get like shitter of the game when you when you end up being the worst player in the game. You don't get like 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 inter of the game. There's no award that you get for being like terrible. So like be having like super high highs. Number one, it's not even like super high highs, right? Because it's in relation to the rest of your team. It's not like every player of the game is equal. Like you could have a player of the game where you're like 50 and zero and you could have a player of the game where you're like one, one and 11 and you got some like good engages and it was a relatively slow game. So like player of the game doesn't matter. Yes, but obviously you haven't smurfed in a very long time, Dom, where you're those, the player of the games people, the ones that are voting for the MVP. So you have to go by what they're doing. So if you're in fucking silver and they're using silver ideas, you don't play plat map play you play silver macro and shit on them is you that actually how it goes yes, it that's how it goes. they do it yes. only off players of the game no but it's the same people that are voting it that's what i'm saying like those <laughs> yeah, are the voters like, of who the mvps yeah i mean be. you're voting it like i would probably vote the same but like what i vote for and who i think is like the most valuable player in the league isn't like the same like i could end up watching a team that i think is shit and they have like like, let's say I was watching Heretics, for example, and I look at all the games and I'm like, damn, like every time they win, Vedio is like popping off on Kaisa and I give him five player of the games. I don't have to turn around and be like, well, I, I gave him five and I got caps, too. So I guess I guess he's like <laughs> almost three times as good as caps. Like, I, I don't have to fucking it's, do that. Type also, of math. They, get, like, they get split up not more. correlated at all. They get split up more on teams with a lot of good players on them, which you basically have to be to be almost undefeated in the league. Right. Yeah. I, th I think that is a thing. good example, but some people will do that, or at least consider that. They yeah, will those consider that. people are idiots, and we don't talk about them on the show. <laughs> so, we'll move on. All right, all right. We'll continue so, on. So, okay, so he first has been, one. He has been convincingly so. You would there isn't really another pick for first team All Pro top laner. Whereas you could make an argument that there, there, there are multiple players you should consider for the AD carry position, right? Which to me just kind of throws out the MVP candidacy of pays immediately. Okay. Um, he also, he also just is kind of the axis around which KT's drafts yeah, turn, right? He, if, if he doesn't have the wide champion pool that he does, it would really limit KT's ability to draft, particularly because they are emphasizing some very limited picks on other players. Like I said, aiming has just gotten Kaisa 10 games in a row now. Two straight weeks of just playing Kaisa, right? Right. And oftentimes it's been, you know, BD. It's not that these players, it's not that aiming can only play Kaisa. It's that they're prioritizing power picks for people like BDD, Cuz, or aiming. And that means that either the the other picks are falling down the draft or they're they're taking a Jax or a Renekton or one of these picks really early on and just blinding it. So he has to play a lot of blind picks and he has to play around what the power picks in the meta are. And sometimes that means he's doing a, a big tank role. Sometimes that means he's doing a split push role. Sometimes that means he's he's playing more of a carry champion in the top lane. So he's really been very wide in terms of his overall champion pool this split. Okay, so right now, point one, and arguably the best player in his role, best top laner. Point mm -hmm. two, the uh, the draft ocean of KT. I'm getting I'm getting styly with it here, Monty. We got to <laughs> we got to speak to the people, right? You know, maybe they're thirsty for for you know an MVP that quenches their thirst for uh, uh, top lane greatness. All right, last one. Let's go, and then we'll we'll dress it up, and then we'll sell it to the people. Um, I mean, it, just in terms of the way he team fights as well, because he has to play all of these different kinds of picks. He adapts his play extremely well to the circumstances. He is probably the best flanking top laner at the moment within the LCK. And he's able to really position effectively no matter what kind of role that he's taking. And his timing is also excellent. Mm, let's see. Adaptable. And timing and flanking. Mm -hmm. leader let's see how do how do we how do we turn that into like a so uh, so he he uh, i mean he's just excellent at positioning regardless of his job in a team fight right all right he's the right place right time 
for your MVP vote. Okay, He's doing right? his fucking Place. job. Right. Nice. And that's that's why people don't realize done. necessarily how good he is because he's just Keen is just a blue collar guy doing the fucking work. You know what I mean? And he's the best at it. That's yes. the, yeah. Let's go with the everyman approach. <laughs> the everyman approach of quenching the thirst of drafts that he's at the right place at the right time and gets the job done. Your MVP. Join the Keen pain, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um, how, how do we how do we feel about this as a? Uh, do you think pay the think MVP of the yeah, league? The Bob? Uh, no. No, I mean, but like MVP, I think is 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 really hard for for me to like because I've always been a, a guy where I care more about like who do I think is the most valuable player. Like who, yeah. if, if you replace anyone, like anyone on any team, who's gonna like which team is gonna be the worst without that player? So like when I think of MVP, like I think of people like Chovy almost automatically. Like that's somebody who I'm like if I'm gonna talk about Gen G. Who's the play? Like if they, I mean, we saw them play with Ruler, right? We saw them go from Ruler to Pays, like. They're, they're still good. Like, obviously, those are both two really insane 80 carries, but I don't necessarily think that, like, if you got another 80 carry that was good, like, let's say you put Viper, for example, on Gen G, like, I think they would be even better, right? So, like, I don't I don't think that Pace is the one that's providing the value to the team. I think that the person that provides the most value generally to that team is Chovy. I think Chovy is, like, super insane. So, like, that, those are the players I care more about than, like, the, uh, than, like, players that are, like, considered maybe better in a way. So... But like, I mean, yeah, I think that 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 Keen deserves it, especially considering like how he's played so far. He's just been so fucking consistent. I think that's the biggest um, argument, I think, for me is he's just good every game where you don't yep. see that out of top laners very often. He's good every game. He's good every game on a bunch of different champions. Um, and that's he's good if he's ahead. Valuable. He's, g- he's good if he's behind. Yep. So, right. The the player that I think of when you bring it up there, Dom, is Viper. Wouldn't Viper be in this conversation as yes. well? Then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's another player that I value super highly. I think Viper is extremely valuable. I think he's the best that he carry in, in in Korea. Like who? Like he gets inted so fucking hard. He gets gets inted so hard constantly. Like they just hate him. I mean, <laughs> it's getting if, better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's getting better. Like, like Jesus. I mean, ever since you know, Clid decided to go out on Facebook and. Go crazy a while out on Facebook. It was you know? uh, it was on Kakao Talk, but sure. <laughs> oh wait, really? They they said Facebook in the article I read. Oh, uh, uh, there there were screenshots from Kakao Talk, which is the Korean messaging. But app. it was on Facebook that they put the screenshots. Ah, uh, maybe maybe that's it. Maybe yeah, I have no idea. Anyway, when Dom that, hesitates like that on how he's gonna say things, I get so fucking nervous that we're about to get canceled. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I had another one. I was gonna say that like I the what I was originally gonna say. You know, I would I wouldn't say this. See that, that, that. Did you hear? Did you hear that? <laughs> I wouldn't say Everybody this. Everybody hear that little I, I wouldn't say this. I, I, I would say that, like, if you, were things, if you were talking about the things that did the most damage on Hanwha Life, I'd say number one is Viper and number two is Clit's Facebook. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I would just say, like, that would just, somebody else might make that joke. So. <laughs> I mean, in a way, you know, Clid's Clid's hands have done a lot of damage, whether he was texting or whether he was trying <laughs> yeah. to play League of Legends. Yeah, so uh, Clid's no. hands were the problem the entire time. Okay, uh, speaking... he belongs in jail one way or the other. <laughs> speaking <laughs> of hands, we, we had we had one of our members of the chat say for MVP because we've seen how the team has responded with and without them. Faker would be on there, and I bring this one up because he said Faker would be on there. After his arm blew up, it's definitely clear how bad the team is. Like, he was like, arm blew up. I had to like scroll back up who he was talking about. He was like, oh, Faker. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that this week, T1 now looks like they look like they're like the players are playing normal again and they are just kind of losing games because Poby is bad. not good at league. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, like it sucks. They, like, were, I don't... they did lose st- straight up game one versus D. Yeah. Oh, the, w- the way he was, he like just walked past them. And I, I loved it. Like you should have seen. Like, in, like, my view, <laughs> in my body, I was a little nervous. And then I saw it. I was like, thank fucking God. <laughs> Damn it. Um, but anyway, to your point about Viper, it's actually crazy because Viper does 35% of Hanwha Life's damage after 15 minutes. That is crazy aiming number two at 33.6 percent but you know pays 31.6 percent but i mean viper for and but by the way guys hanwa actually has been better in the late game than they have been in the early game which is why i think they're improving with grizzly because he kind of he's cross mapping most of the time and he's picking up objectives which allows them to kind of just sit around and wait for the late game longer 
Uh, but Viper has been extremely good in late game situations, and it, it, without him, Hanwha would be garbage. Yeah, people, what, what people don't understand is how hard it is to play the game when you're behind like this. Like Viper's not playing the same game when he's playing AD carry as, like for example, when Genji's winning or when when uh when KT's winning. Like there's so much more vision. There's so much more like uh, people are like being accounted for. Like it's so much easier for aiming to play a team fight with like Keen being a monster and absorbing so much space and them like having all this vision, knowing where the flanks are. Lehen seems like the type of support where he just knows what the fuck is going on. When you watch Lehen's teams, it feels like he just knows how to like set up the fight for people. Like he knows what his job is, what he needs to do, where he needs vision, how to play around his AD. He, like Lehen's just always ends up making, besides for that one split that he played with like Hanwha Life way back when they just, or uh, Griffin, I guess it was at that point where they were just complete ass. Besides for that, he's been like really fucking good. You have to understand that Viper plays with like no vision. He plays with no vision, no people like frontlining for him. He doesn't play with like people on flanks marking. It's just like all about him trying to just imagine, play the whole situation by imagine, himself. Imagine, imagine trying to play as an AD carry when your jungler and support are the worst players on your team. Oh yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. That's all it is like for me. Um, <laughs> all right, so our campaign trail here. I got it. Uh if, if you're looking for an MVP candidate that is best in class, environmentally friendly, especially with the ocean, <laughs> and it is at the right place at the right time that can get the job done, your man is keen. <laughs> Join the keen pain revolution. For <laughs> keen uh, for MVP. Keen do, for not, MVP. do not let the Korean community slash caster slash media vote pays as MVP. That is a disgrace. It is a disgrace. Keen will be robbed, guys. All right. Oh, that's a good one. He's the new keen pin. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Okay. Next up, time for everyone's newest favorite segment. It's time for a little bit of Devoured, where we're going to dive into Fnatic and playoff performances, as well as the fading dreams of playoffs for FlyQuest and who should pay for that. Who's going to get in trouble there? Let's get on to it. Let's get to Devoured. Make sure to get your tongue-twisting, mind-warping, sour thrills at trolley.com. Dom, time to eat one. Let's do it. By the way, guys, uh, if you're wondering where you can buy trolleys, you can use on our Twitch, exclamation point trolley, and that'll give you a link. Or there's a link now down below on the YouTube videos. So, but, you know, basically anywhere is the answer. Do, do you have a 7-Eleven, Target, grocery store near you? They're everywhere, and they're delicious. And got to the other side, you know how like you have like taste for oh, different sides yes. to the other one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Let's go. All right, Dom, it's time. We're gonna go on Fly Quest. Fly Quest tried to do fuck is in this corner. Fly Quest tried to do <laughs> the team liquid and do the APA mid lane swap, and bam, here's your mid laner fix. Spyrax is time to come on in. Vikla, he's done. Get him out. We, they practice scrims. It's time to give Spyrax a time. The man from Maryville University who's been toiling his way on up gets his shot. Gets stuffed by Palafox and Energy in their what felt like the must-win game, the winnable game. It was game. really must-win for them because yeah. they, they the needed to overtake NRG uh, in the standings. I mean, every everything is basically just a giant disaster for FlyQuest right now because when you when you look at the way that they've lost some of these these other matches too because they what they're down 02 in tiebreakers to uh Dignitas so even yeah, if they were to tie with thieves. and 100 these cuz they get for whatever reason they just get clapped in bottom lane whenever they play 100 thieves I think thieves. the reason is cuz they suck at league I'm pretty sure but I'm not Oh okay 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 oh, right. yeah so <laughs> great thanks so, for clearing that up well show's over Let's yeah, go <laughs> I mean, look, I don't even care about the team. I want to talk about the fucking management because this like this has to uh -oh. be one of the worst PR statements we've seen based off an action in game. So coming into the, the series or coming into the games this week, as Degon pointed out, they decided to sub in Spyrex. Then after game one, they go back to Vikla. And this was their statement. I'm going to read their statement now. 
They said, for our match against Evil Geniuses today, Vikla will return as our starting LCS mid laner. This decision was pre-planned regardless of yesterday's outcome. We're incredibly proud of Spyrax for jumping into practice this week and showcasing a strong performance against NRG. With the high level of gameplay he's demonstrated in the NACL this summer, we felt it right to recognize and reward that with an opportunity in the LCS. We will continue to evaluate the best starting roster for our LCS program for the remainder of the split. So number one, anyone with a brain just can recognize this is complete bullshit. They pre-planned the decision to play a player and then swap to, to their normal, their starting mid laner the next day, regardless of the outcome of the first game. So they, so they have six games left. They're almost essentially all must wins. Like Monty said, this game against NRG is a must win. So are they this fucking bad of an organization that they're pre-planning? They're like, oh, you play this game, you play the other game, and they weren't going to evaluate performance at all. So if, so if, so if Spirex came in for Vikla, he went 30-0. and 0, He is the second coming of Faker. He's the best player we've ever seen. They would have just benched him anyway for Vikla. I'm supposed to believe that? Like, do you think I'm fucking stupid? Why would you ever say that to me? Like, it just makes no fucking sense. Like, this is, it, it's, it's beyond stupid what they say. Number two, they in the second paragraph, they talk about it being a reward, like it's some fucking make-a-wish type shit, where they're like, yeah, you, know, you did really great at NACL, Spyrax, you get to play one game on stage, here you go, and then he like runs it down, and they're like, you deserve that, buddy, like, what the fuck is that? You, so, so you have six must-win games, and you're gonna throw away one of them in like a, a reward for, for your for your mid laner, you do that shit when you're super far ahead in the standings. JDG did that recently yep. with, with their with their sub, with their sub mid laner. They said, hey, Knight, like, we're probably the best team in the world. We've already solidified like one, two. We can't move up. We can't move down. Let's let this guy play. Like, let's let this guy play a game. Like, hopefully you can gain something out of that. You don't do that shit when you're a team that, that is competing for your playoff life. You're on the line of not making top eight. And then... Wait, wait, wait. Maybe it is a make-a-wish type scenario because the LCS is dying. So there's only a limited amount of time to get players <laughs> to play in there. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is a make-a-wish. So then... Papa Smithy comes out with a statement trying to walk it back. He said, after splitting scrims this week, giving Spyrex LCS time was an easy decision. It was an easy decision. It was an easy decision to decide to play Spyrex in LCS when you have six games left and they're all must wins. How are you making any easy decisions at this point? Like, this is like crazy to me to even think that this was something that they were like, yeah, we didn't even really think about it. Like, it was just like easy thing to do. Spyrex was playing well in scrims, so we decided that he was just going to play. Both he and Vickler performed well in practice and provide us with different options in draft. They they played Jace in the first they two games. They both played Jace. I they both played the same exact game. It's like so fucking dumb, bro. Like, I, I don't even understand how, how these organizations don't realize, like, uh, do they think that no one could put anything together? Like, I still watch the fucking LCS. Uh, maybe they think no one watches it. I still watch the LCS, so I see when this shit happens. And then they say, with our LCS scenario, uh, we will continue to prepare different roster scenarios for each opponent. So you put in a player... And you're trying to tell me that you weren't going to evaluate his performance at all. You just put him in and you just like took your blinders off. You're like, all right, he's in game one. You're in game two. When Vickla was smurfing in game number two, I tweeted out that for the next match, we've decided that Vickla will return or that uh, Sparex will return as our starting mid laner. This decision was pre-planned regardless of yesterday's outcome. I tweeted this shout this shit out mid fucking game because I knew how stupid it is. Like, obviously, you are trying to figure out what's going to work for your team. You're on the chopping block and you're trying different approaches because you think that this is going to give yourself the best chance of winning. I don't understand why they have to feed some bullshit where they're like, this was like for, for little Spyrax to get his time in, in, in LCS. It makes no sense. It's like so ridiculous. So, I mean, this just shows a little insight into the organization and how they think that this is somehow a good PR statement when it's completely obvious what they were doing the entire time. Yeah, I think so. Just correct me if I'm wrong here. You felt fine with the move. You just hate the way that it was phrased. The move. I just don't believe them. I think they're liars. I think I think Papa Smithy is lying. That it was pre-planned. I still yes. feel like this was the right move to make. Don't you think? Like, yes, you just... I, I think a hundred percent that they that they were about. Like, it, it, I I don't think Papa Smithy is an idiot. I think that if he did, if it was pre-planned and he wasn't going to care regardless of. So like the team has been playing like shit with Vikla, right? They were three and nine. So you're telling me that that regardless of how Spirex performed, if he performed really well, they're just going to go back to Vic no matter what. If they've been looking like shit the entire time, they played with Spirex and they actually looked good with him, they're not going to ride it out and try to collect some wins. Like, I don't think that he's stupid. So I don't think that he would do that. And if you did do that, then you're just stupid. So then therefore it's a lie, which yeah. is how you feel. 
Yes, I think it's just a lie. I think that they're straight up lying. I think it is complete bullshit that you would that you would give a player like like NACL time in in a professional like this is something that Immortals did back with a uh, pretty over insanity where they were, but they say that at the beginning as well. And obviously what people are pointing out was like, Oh, well the obvious way that like you do this is like, even if it was pre-planned, you don't want to say it at the beginning because the other teams can prepare. Rosters I, are like, locked the day before. Like the team knows who's playing the day before. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, sure. Like, but it's, it's not even that it's like, how could this ever be the right decision? How could it ever be the right decision to ignore performance when you're in a dire circumstance? I can't, I can't believe it. I, I, it just, it cannot be true. So would you have rather them just, so you're fine with these moves. You would just rather them say, Hey, we're going to be be honest about the whole situation. Spyrax. We'll see who plays for the rest of the week. It's fucking obvious, right? Like everyone knows watching FlyQuest. It's like the team is shit. Let's try something else. And maybe the team will be less shit. Like with somebody else. Like, is that not obviously what they're doing? The team was complete dog shit with Vikla. We coincidentally replaced our worst performing member with somebody else, but just for one game, just because that guy actually like performed really well in NACL and we care about NACL, which is why we did that two week walkout at the beginning. Like, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up and give it to me straight. You want your team to try to qualify. You are desperate. You're fucking desperate. You're on the verge of not making top eight in a 10 fucking team league. You played Spyrex because you thought it would give you a better chance to win. And then he went in and he fucking ran it down. And now at the end, you're trying to like not ruin his career by being like, actually, like this was pre-planned. Like it was just a job for like no one cares, bro. You tried Spyrex. It didn't work out. You went back to Vikla. That's it. I, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Shout outs to TSM for letting Ruby to play a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least you have a sample size at that point, right? I mean, uh, look, to Vigla's credit, he did play better played, the next couple played, of games. He played a lot better. Yeah, which is why, like, it's such... Uh, so, did, did they pre- they were going to pre-plan a roll swap back, or, like, are the other players going to play? Like, what, what does it mean? Like, you pre-plan decisions <laughs> when you're on the fucking chopping block. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, if anything, it's a little bit surprising that they didn't swap him out sooner. I think that yeah. if the criticism I would give is that they really needed to do this. I, I, look, I think it was hard because here's the thing. No, it was you roll a easy decision. Through, you roll through. No, here's why. Here's why I think it was harder. You roll through the first two weeks, right? You're 0 and 6, but then you go 3 and 0 with Vikla. So do you sub him out the next week? And then after they went 0 and 3, that is when they subbed him out, right? Yeah. So it's, but that, that's when it became easy again. Sure. Based on the I mean, but the argument you should have made is that even when they were going, when, even when they went 3 and 0, they looked rough yeah. going 3 and 0. And so that's why I didn't flip or have any kind of fa- you know faith or confidence in them again. Uh, I agreed with you guys, and I-, I think you still like at least put Spyrex in for one of those games in the next week of competition and just see what happens, right? But it seems like they were a little bit slow to pull the trigger there, and, and now we are we are where we are, um, you know. And the reality is now FlyQuest has to go three and zero, and not only that, but they have to hope that either Hundred Thieves or Dignitas. Goes zero, three. Th- goes zero three and the worst part of this is that they play each other so it's whichever team loses their first match of the week has to then lose out the rest of the matches <laughs> and FlyQuest has to beat TSM and C9 which you know C9 hasn't been looking as good recently they did beat EG FlyQuest so it's not impossible but it does seem real fucking hard yeah I mean so what do you think about the statements in general you think it's complete bullshit I mean, I think it's badly phrased and like I don't understand why they would do that because they're not hi- they're not hiding their hand as as Degon points out because even if we don't know publicly, the teams definitely know because there's a roster submission deadline and then those rosters are given to the teams so that they have adequate time to prepare for their opponent. Yeah. This yeah, happens in every League of Legends league. Yeah. yeah, but they're saying that it was pre-planned so I guess it would be one day earlier, right? Oh, because no, obviously no, no. Like pre plan would mean that like they went and they they knew it on Friday, but then they don't you, let you, you know obviously until Saturday. submit your rosters for the next day after you've completed your matches yeah. for that day because other because you need to have that information in order to make decision. So yeah, if if they had won and Spyrex had popped off, would he come back and play the same fucking champion potentially the next day? Then yes, I would think he would. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I retweeted this and said, "Oh dear," because it's it 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 just it just feels like panic. I still. feel feel like this is the right play but i feel like this is incredibly poor handling of spyrax's career like you just that just and they're trying to cover it up here but like 
it, who is this PR for? Planned. Like everyone sees right through this bullshit. Yeah. Like yeah. who is I have this? no are idea. Saying, oh, they're just doing PR. It's like, right. that is fucking stu- that is a bad way to do PR. You don't do PR in a way I, where everyone I, sees through think it and thinks was, you're a liar. This was mishandled, but I also credit FlyQuest because if anything, FlyQuest has been one of the most transparent rosters in terms of getting Nick Fon and, and Papa Smithy on camera to talk about their roster and any true. changes that they're making. And it, I think that they've done a really good job about being honest and transparent. So did they fuck this up? Yeah. But I think on the mo- for the most part, I think they've done a good job with explaining very publicly why they're doing what they're doing. And Papa Smithy has a track record of doing that. Remember for a while, he was doing the apology tour for 100 Thieves when they sucked. And then he came yeah. on in and they got a championship. And even when they fell short, remember three in a row, that whole architecture, he's able to take that credit. Now he's got to take some of the blame. You know, people are like, wow, why, who, who should get in trouble for that? Like at the end of the day, like it is Pop Smithy, it is Nick Van that control these types of things. And if this was TSM, if this was Dignitas, like Dom is saying, we would be all over it probably like three, four, five times harder. And, but right now, this is a team no, that I all agree. wanted to succeed. This is a team that, and an organization that we all want to succeed and represent North America because we've seen how good they could be. And instead they're not playing well. And then this fumble on the, on the, the back end, the organizational side is just confusing. Well, I mean, it's, it's also like Papa Smithy tweeted this out also before the games. So like what he says is not in line with what FlyQuest said, right? Like what FlyQuest is saying is that it was like, we had already decided everything. It was just because this guy performed well. It has nothing to do with performance or anything like that. And then Papa Smithy's angle is more him and Vikla performed well, and they're different players that give us different options in draft. So it like it allows us to have, you know, multiple different ways where we can throw things at opponents. That's not the same as just like a charity game. They, so right. one's a charity game, and then Papa Smithy's like, but they're different players and we're evaluating it. Are you evaluating it? Because what, what the organization said was that you weren't evaluating it at all. It was just based off like you wanted to give him a game and then we pre-planned to put the other guy in. I think I think ultimately, like uh, from my from what I know and from what Papa has said was that he when he joined the roster, he was very publicly complimentary of Nick Fon for putting this roster together that started to, to perform really well as soon as they got to LCS. And a lot of that was already in motion by the time he got his job at, uh, at FlyQuest and his uh, to be clear, his job is much more distant from the League of Legends team than it was when he was at 100 Thieves. Like, he's the president of the organization that is doing many different initiatives right now, and he's much more on kind of the uh, corporate end. And I think he's still trying to, ex- because he is a public fig- figure in League of Legends, he is trying to explain some of these changes. But he himself might not be very in touch with what's going on with the roster. So then why uh, is he making the state of the statement? Just because he's, he's he has a public to. platform. Yeah, yeah, he's 100 percent. Because he has a platform. Yeah, I think that's fine. Like, I think that but makes I, sense. I think he should but probably it's not what they said. So it's like, I know, uh, I know. Who do we yeah. blame? Jerry Jones getting I mad think, at the Cowboys and he can I think do whatever. He, and then Michael McCarthy I, I think like, he's not what we're doing. Yeah. I think he's trying to be helpful, but he doesn't have all of the facts. And so he's looking bad as a result. Well, uh, again, the fly quest season of uh, of what was great potential not being reached. The North American classic has its final chapter coming up this week, possibly it's final chapter. Who knows? So yep. maybe it's a fairy tale run here yeah. and they're able to get well, the last thing I want to say on this is just, I want to say that what I think happened was FlyQuest put out the statement. It was complete dog shit. And Papa Smithy tried to make it seem more reasonable because to any thinking person, Possible. the FlyQuest statement is just like, wow, you're terrible as an organization. If this is how you guys operate, if you guys operate completely in the dark, with like performance it's like performance on the side like this guy played like then you're just terrible so he tried to make it seem like no we're actually thinking about this and we're trying to win because the other one sounds like they don't even care about lcs it literally sounds like they just give they don't give a fuck about lcs this guy can play a game because he played one well in nacl like that was that was what they said he played because he he did well in nacl no it it didn't necessarily give us a better chance to win we knew that it like it wasn't even about winning that game it was just about rewarding him it's like good boy here's your dog treat like the fuck <laughs> i feel like there there is truth to that but most of it has to be like it gives us a better chance to win we want to see we need to see if it's the stage jitters are just because of uh vikla or if it's a spyrax it's it's a team thing and they got their answer and you know however they want to dress that up they dress that up um another organization who is 
on the cusp of having a disappointing year after got possibly eaten having up a by year. their opponents. Uh, Fnatic over there <laughs> in uh, the LEC. So Fnatic, again, you've got KDA King on the bottom side of the map, the second coming of uh, Viper, sure. Uh, <laughs> Noah coming on in and having the hell of the season. They finish their split over in second. And then they drop to SK, and now they're on the cusp of possibly not making it to the championships as well. Your possible pick to make it out, Dom, but kind of give us your thoughts here on Fnatic's uh, struggle and, if anything, choke here in the group stages. Yeah, I mean, Noah's from Korea, and, you know, he was there for over nine games, which means the skill vampires are here. We saw what the first <laughs> nine games look like for Prince. No! We've seen it before. They can make through one round robin. Yeah, that's what happened with Prince, right? Was the Prince also nine to zero in the first round, Robin? Like you can make what, it through they one. They can make it through one round, Robin, and that's when that's when the the yep. the garlic wears off and the skill vampires can descend. It's when yep. night falls. Exactly. So the the skill vampires are here. They they got Noah. It's unfortunate. Rest in peace, Noah. And apparently they've also got humanoid. Like it was just collateral damage. <laughs> While they were there, they decided they, they weren't they weren't satisfied with just Noah's blood, so they went over to humanoid's room and you know got it got some of his as well. So yeah, I mean it's just <laughs> it was tough to watch the fanatic games. I mean they looked they were always kind of bad macro wise. If you watch how their games played out, a lot of the time they were throwing in the mid game. Just a bad fight. They would give a Baron. You know, the enemy team would just start a Baron and they just wouldn't be prepared for it and they'd have to stall out. But they were getting such big early game leads that it didn't really matter. They were still able to win the game. But now they're not getting the early game leads. So they have no macro to fall back on. They aren't going to be able to outplay their opponents. They're not doing creative swaps or anything like that. So they just aren't used to playing from behind and they're, they were just behind consistently in the series. Also, and what happens if you just ignore baron at 20 minutes when the enemy team has tristana and kaisa or you walk into five man maokai ults or you just get ejected via a poppy ult so you could never actually fight in a game yeah. just free, free barons all over the place for sk just yeah, fucking unlucky. free <laughs> yeah i mean it was just super free also Oscarinen got his head caved in from irrelevant by irrelevant <laughs> like irrelevant yep <laughs> god damn He's also got an uh, ironic name, just like the LCK top laners. You know, he's, he's chilling. <laughs> Doo-doo versus Irrelevant. Battle of the kings of top lane. <laughs> yeah, the best top laners. <laughs> Doo-doo and Irrelevant. Explaining that to non-league people or just non-gaming people would be like, what is happening here? <laughs> That's the, one uh, of the best parts about esports, man. What, what would esports be if we used people's real name? Fucking boring. That's what it would be. I don't know. Christian Rivera stealing a Baron sounds pretty cool. I'll give you that, Tom. Like that, that uh, us with like the neutral Hispanic sounding last names. It's like, all right, what are they? Are you know you could you could be black and have like a Hispanic <laughs> last name. You could be Asian, Hispanic. Now. You could be Asian <laughs> with a Hispanic last name. You know, one of those things, right? You don't even know what position they play, right? If it's a yeah. football player and their name's Rivera, it could be a receiver, it could be a lineman. Probably not a quarterback, but maybe like a running back, you know. Yeah, could Mark got... Sanchez was the quarterback. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Way to go, Marky Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. But that, famous Broncos probably. quarterback, Mark Sanchez. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> for the rough days, man. His career highlight is him uh, eating a hot dog on a bench. <laughs> no, the butt fumble. The Come butt on, man. Fumble, bro. I, I think that, that the, the, Hot dog on a bench is more iconic. Like when I when I get recommended both videos, I think I think him eating the hot dog trying to hide it on the bench like that that had more views. <laughs> this is I'm gonna the Mark butt fumble is also iconic. I'm, I'm putting in Mark Sanchez right now on Google. Mark what comes up first. All right, let's All right. see. And then, then go to video. Sorry, let me go to video. Google video. And it's a lot of talk show stuff. He's done a good job wiping the internet from the butt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, look, go to it on. Okay, so on YouTube, I get recommended the eats a hot dog first, but the butt fumble <laughs> has more views. Ooh, All right, okay. Uh, Mark Sanchez. <laughs> Not fumble, just Mark Sanchez. You're right. It is the hot dog is first. <laughs> but but the butt fumble has more views, but also the butt fumble is more rewatchable. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Eating the hot dogs. This and more. Right. Follow Last Free Nation Sports. <laughs> yeah. Coming up soon. Uh, what is your greatest memory of uh, three hours the, on Mark? The, 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 the Hall of Fame career of Mark Sanchez. Yeah. 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 
and his Speaking contribution. Speaking of taking hot dogs, back to Fnatic. Let's say, there oh, we God. Go. Thank you. Uh, all right. So if they don't make it on through, this year is blank for Fnatic. Fill in the blank. Uh, a Dardo Masterclass. <laughs> that's, um, that's my that's my uh, that's me filling in the blank right there. Finally, the end of the Razor humanoid disaster. Hopefully, oh, oh, no way. <laughs> the cranky couple. Let's see what his chat got for this one's fucked, suffer as fucked, Jover. That's what the kids say. Jover is a good one. <laughs> Any more? Let us know in the comments over at our YouTube channel here again. Fnatic and FlyQuest getting devoured by their opponents in the most important times of the season here. Uh, and we'll see how these stories play out. Thankfully, we'll get one more, at least one more week of them. Maybe more if the miracle comes through, but at least one more. Uh, thanks to our friends over at Trolley. Make sure to head on over to Trolley.com to see where you can get yours. Uh, and thanks for being a partner here of power spike next up it's time for galaxy brain club as we go global look at that we got a lot of people heading on in we go global with our coverage uh the top teams of the world are heading to playoffs g2 and jdg are two of them can anyone stop them that's what we discuss in this week's galaxy brain club all right Let's start with G2. We just saw them finish on up. They cleaned house here in their playoff series. Who can beat G2? Can anyone beat G2 as BDS got mowed over? Koi got punched on it. Man, Shigenda looked really bad in it. Like, you know, Broken Blade it looks like the best top laner in the league. Can anyone catch G2 and how do they do it? No, they can't. And the reason why is because G2 is just playing a completely different game than everyone else. Like, they could... <laughs> They can play I love the rel Yeah, they can play rel in multiple roles. You have to worry about so many picks when you play against G2. Now they're pulling out things like the Lucian mid. They're one of the only teams Kalista. that can play Tristana. They play Kalista. So there's like Kalista Braum you have to worry about. You have to worry about Kaisa. You have to worry about Rel because they flex it. You have to worry about Ivern, which is like super OP right now. Um, not sure about Rumble. Maybe maybe that's an angle that you can have over them, but I think they can play too many things, and they also are just like by far the best team when it comes to getting themselves out of bad situations by doing proactive things. Like, for example, the BDS game, the second game, they're like super behind. Uh, you know, BB is, is smurfing on top, then he gets ganked a couple times, Rakan blows his flash, he gets solo killed. Then they're in a bad situation. What do they do? They swap the Kalista top. The Kal Kalista Braum go top. They get a free kill on the Olaf. Then BB's able to, like, with this tempo, get a uh, bot turret. And they're able to just get out of these really bad situations. They just play to together as a team. And they solve the problems in game where it feels like other teams kind of just, like, idle. And, like, they just try to not lose too much on the side. They don't do proactive things. And obviously there is counterplay. Like, you can match the swaps. You can predict the swaps and, and go there before. You know, you should be able to accelerate the game or get more on the side of the map if you are splitting the map um as the winning team you should be able to get more on that on the side of the map that you're dominant on but it seems like no other team is even close to that with with g2 so there are issues with the team they're not a perfect team but i think they're so f far ahead of everyone else in europe right now well, I think also when it comes to this meta, like we see both what they can do when they have the Kaisa themselves, as well as how they're willing to play into it. And I really like the fact that we're seeing more of the Kalista because it's a return to what we love to see from Hansama. Like he historically, he's a super dominant Kalista player. He's a super dominant Draven player. I mean, this is what we missed when he was at Team Liquid, is that his one of his great powers is that he can dominate the lane in the bot side, which then leads to potential win conditions such as early stacking of dragons, right? And I think the Callista picks have worked really well into some of the lower range compositions that we've seen teams use into them. And they've been able to convert those leads into, into victories. So I also, you know, we have engaged supports back in the meta and Mickey X, who, as we've discussed on this show, might be the leading candidate for MVP of the entire year for LEC. The more agency you can give this guy. Remember that he was doing fucking phenomenally roaming on the map as Heimerdinger in the for in winter split. Right. Like, I, who the fuck does that? I mean, he was making plays where he would roam into top lane as Heimerdinger and getting kills. Now he can actually just be completely unlocked. 
uh, with with a lot of these engaged supports. And the best part, I think, for G2 is that it opens up like they they were playing a little bit off meta with some of Yikes like carry junglers. But as I mentioned in terms of the meta earlier, now that Mickey X can fill a primary engage role, well, this is going to really open the, the Yike toolbox, I think, in really good ways in the same way that it does with D plus with Canyon. So I think this is a great meta for them. I also love the fact that we got to hear it in the interview after G2's victory. They're constantly finding different champs to utilize in the mid lane as well. The Tristana was being passed over, so you need to know how to play Tristana, you know how to play Jace. When people banned that out, Caps was like, yeah, they banned out Tristana as they pick Jace. I could just play Lucian. Lucian provides the same type of thing. You have the gap closer, the burst onto uh, Jace before he could really do anything. And I love the fact that they're innovating that. Even in the series before, Caps played into Tristana as uh, uh, Nico and then gets to play the Tristana afterwards. So Caps is back in a super great form as well. You know, yep. you talk about Mickey being dominant. You talk about uh, Broken Blade being great. Caps is back too, back to Claps, away from Craps. And it's... Like, really cool timing to see it now. The worry is, you know, will they have that form at Worlds later on? Sure, we'll figure that out later. But it's cool to see this G2 uh, dominating the league because the league is so much better for it. And it, they're the ones that generally make Europe better. They're the ones that are like that, that, that training post that everyone has to try and catch up to. Yeah, I mean, I like the fact that we're seeing things like I think the game plans also like, well, look, we know Dylan Falco is a really smart coach and he often has very custom tailored game plans to his opponents. But I like the fact that we got to see lethal tempo trundle, which is not a, you know, normally we see press the attack trundle, trundle, but lethal tempo trundle is like a I am going to duel you and fuck you up, you know, trundle build, which is like what we saw when he can kind of solo out Malrong and like it it felt like the compositions G2 were running were really targeted at just skirmishing and dueling and punishing Malrong in the early stages of the game. And it, it was very effective. Who is the closest team that can close the gap here, Dom? Oh, I don't think anyone. I don't <laughs> think there is the closest team. Like, uh, I mean, who do you have to choose from right now? Fnatic and Mad both look, they look terrible. You know, you have BDS, who they just beat. Yeah. You have XL, who we don't think is good. And then who's left? Heretics SK? Like, there's no one. Nah, there's no one that can... Contend. I mean, the Heretics like, matchup is is bad just because of the Broken Blade thing. Like, you know, you have a strong carry top laner, and it just kind of makes it very difficult for Heretics to win the game. I don't, um, I don't think... Yeah, I don't know. It, it's really hard. Like, I, there's no way I can say that XL is the second... Like, if XL is the second best team in Europe... It's going to be a rough world unless G2 can just, you know, separate themselves and everyone will just be like, Europe's actually really good. It's not just G2 is good. It's, uh, the whole region is strong right now. Thank God G2 is looking good because when they were looking bad, you just start feeling like everything is doomed. All right. Well, we'll see. Uh, we've got Gilius in the chat. He said maybe Excel because they are good. Thanks for the analysis. <laughs> yeah, just ignore that guy. He he randomly likes he randomly likes uh, XL because XL is pretty much just old Chelka at this point. Like you have Abadage, you have <laughs> Lumet, <laughs> Tim Roto Roto like, You just have everyone. You know, this is what it is. Well, let's yeah, Odo as well. Let's shift to another dominant team uh, in their domestic region. It would be JDG over at the LPL. They've been head and shoulders above everyone else. It, Dom, LPL no, is brilliant. No, they head and shoulders. Wait, JDG? Is that what JDG, it? yes. Other than the fact that they lost to, what, IG? Is that who they, that was? They I lost mean, BLG is about? like, like obviously when they play each other, JDG has been beating BLG, but BLG has been like, I mean, BLG is the best series record in the history of LPL. They're 15 and one. 30 and seven game score, 81% win rate. Yeah, but JDG is 29 and seven. So they're only one actual game behind, and their one loss did come. Yeah, to that's JDG. my point. They're close. No. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, they're very. Close. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say JDG is by far like JDG Whatever. and BLG are the two best teams in the LPL. Who else can catch them? OMG, <laughs> OMG's got the clutch factor. Oh my god, he's uh, Dom. Did you know? Here, here's a here's a fun potential OMG stat for you. What is Yone's win percentage in the major four leagues right now? Yone's win percentage overall in the major four leagues? Yeah. I feel like I always see this champion win. It's got to be like 80% or something. It's 71% right now. 
I was surprised. I, I was that. looking up some. I was looking up some champ stats today because I was doing some research on on Kaisa win rates, who's at fifty six percent. And I was very surprised to see that of champions that are picked with relative frequency, that Yone's win percentage is really high. He is seventeen and seven. Jeez. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, something that that OMG plays also really well. Hilariously, Rumble. What what would you guess across major regions for Rumble? It, I mean, it's got to be like, I would guess 70% plus again, like 75%. Yeah, 64%, 18 and 10. So it it looks like, my point is, is it looks like, first off, OMG is yeah, probably oh, shit, I forgot. I forgot I watched, uh, I watched T1 play it and they're losing yep. every game. Gene <laughs> <laughs> yeah. also lost with it, to be fair. Gene uh, yeah. is also lost with Rumble. Yeah, um, I guess he's not MVP then. The champion is <laughs> broken. Our campaign but, fell apart. But it does feel like... Uh, you know, you, you say it for the memes, but the, the meta does feel like it's kind of like moving into o the OMG camp a little bit. Yeah, I think the, the meta has been really good for OMG. I think the only reason they're dropping games before is they they could play every single champion in the meta where other teams can't do that. Like they can play LeBlanc on blue side. They can play Kaisa, all this type of stuff. They just didn't have draft priority. Correct. Like they were ending up in situations where like they thought Kaisa was able to be given over to red side, which is what a lot of teams early on thought when they got to like 13, 12, that you could give Kaisa, like you could like first pick Nico, give Kaisa. And now they realize like, no, Kaisa is super fucking broken. Yes. Like Tristana is a flex for them. They're not only playing it bot, you know, Rumble's perm ban for, for, versus them. I think Renekton is a champion that OMG should try to take out of draft, but they can play everything that, that that's in the meta right now. So I think that, that they're actually at a pretty good spot all things considered also cream has been having his best split um ever so like even though omg dropped like a series to tt they lost to ts 2-1 i still think that like the team is completely fine they just needed to take those losses to be challenged in their understanding of the meta it felt like before that they were kind of just like letting teams get away with turbo drafts you look at like the drafts versus tt and <laughs> tt some somehow is getting like they're getting just Kaisa on red side every single game. It's like, what the fuck? Like, how is this possible? Jackie Love Kaisa dropped 20 kills. I mean, they had to learn this lesson, you know, some way. And this is how they did. Uh, Monty, it's happening again. It's another. I, I think this this happened again. Last this happened last split, right? OMG has to play through top esports and rookie to make it to the playoffs to the double in bracket portion of it. So yet again, it is a, a fan favorite squad against preventing rookie from getting to an international <laughs> event for the which LPL. they did barely win uh, against. I mean, they could still sports. make it. Like both both teams could still make it with the championship points. Yeah, yeah, and regional gauntlet. All right. Well, look, man, uh, I'm just happy. Know. I'm just happy that OMG and LNG are on opposite sides of the bracket this time. So I yeah, don't so have to OMG watch. doesn't beat their ass again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That would make me very sad. Again, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got fucking demolished. Look, in if spring, LNG can't crazy. make it, to, yeah, if LNG they did, if LNG doesn't make it to double a limb with RNG, NIP, and Weibo on their side of the bracket, they don't deserve fucking anything. So, this yeah. they should be able to get out of this one into double a limb at the very least. All right, I mean, Weibo versus LNG, I think, will be a pretty good series, but sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the I think the first round teams are way weaker than they normally are. Like RNG, NIP, EDG, WE, I feel like these teams should not have a chance. You know, they're just, they seem really weak. I mean, RNG, NIP, that's got to be one of the weakest 7, 10 seeds we've had. You know, normally we have like BLG or some team that like is supposed to be a super team in that match. I think about last year where you had OMG, who was, you know, like looking like they're a decent team playing versus FPX in the first round. Like that was the 8 9. And then on the other side of it, um, I believe you had BLG playing versus. Who did you have? You had BLG playing versus. Let me look it up. You had BLG playing versus uh, LNG on the other side of the bracket, and that's like you know LNG with Tarzan um, and uh, doing B, and then BLG obviously has been and like they had essentially what was supposed to be a super team way way been um, Fofo, yeah, all those guys uh, on that side as well. So uh, normally the first round feels a lot different than it feels the split. It feels like there's definitely like a top six and then everyone else. BLG, JDG, LNG, Top Esports, OMG, and Weibo. So, all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens here. Um, when when do the matches start here, Dom, for the playoffs? Thursday. Thursday, and then uh, the, gauntlet, the gauntlet of uh, LPL playoffs it's, it's, begins. It's actually crazy how fast 
the LPL ends both the regular season and then just does fi- all the playoffs in two weeks and it's just over. Yep. They're, they're over on the 5th of August, guys. Right? Yep. And, and then you have regional finals, but I mean, yeah, we had to make time for the Asian games, but Worlds doesn't start until October 10th. It's over two months since the end, since the, you know, from the summer finals to the start of Worlds. And that's Tom. just, group, that's just play ins. It's yeah. 11 days straight, right? I'm looking at the schedule now. I think there's like one, isn't there a one day break? Thursday, Friday. Saturday, yeah, there's Sunday. a one day break. There's Sunday, a, the 28th Sunday, is Thursday. off, I think. Oh, Friday, Friday is off. Got it. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah and okay, then there's a it. one day break in semifinals as well. So I guess it's like eight series in a row. That's insane. And there's a one day break. Then there's another two series and a one day break. And then another series. And then there's don't, like a four day break in, in between. Don't die, Dom. Don't die, Dom. Yeah, I'll try not to. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Hopefully the schedule holds up. Don't tell All me right. what to do, Monty. If I want to die, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Well, you, <laughs> I, I support your choices. <laughs> All right. Appreciate well, it. The those were. So, our... no, no, I want to go back. No, I, right. we didn't answer, answer the question. Do like, you who's think JD? Do, do, yeah. Do you think JDG is going to win? Yeah. I okay. mean, they just right. they just counter BLG <laughs> stylistically, but I think BLG like could make a run in like I mean we saw. At MSI, I mean, you could make the argument at MSI that BLG did better into T1 than JDG did. Like JDG and T1, that was a back and forth close series. BLG just looked significantly better than T1. I mean, obviously, T1's not going to be at like the next international, so it's going to be like uh, it's a won't be T1 that they're playing against, like maybe like KT or something. But I could see BLG doing well into the Korean teams. Sure. I mean, Is I it? don't think highly of of LCK at the moment. Like basically, it's KT and Gen G. And then everyone else has made roster changes. Like literally the next best three teams, which are Hanwha, D plus and T1 have all had roster instability or two of them are trying to play rookie players now. So, I mean, they got to get it together quickly. Certainly there's a potential for growth, but it, it's not looking super deep in the LCK at the moment. Is there another team other than BLG since obviously BLG is performing well? They've had a lot of series against each other that could stylistically match up against JDG. I don't think so. Maybe Weibo. Like, but Weibo probably won't make it to that point. But Weibo, I think, is the the bet. They have, like, Weibo is very annoying for JDG to play against. Actually, I believe Weibo, is, have they won both series into them? They might have won both series into JDG that they played. Yeah, they actually have won. They're the only team they did in, in the spring. world. That, yeah, yeah and, they, and they won again in summer. So they're the only team in the world that has positive win rate into JDG. I, uh, yeah, well. Well, to get there, they got to go through your LNG there, Monty. (laughs) I mean, look, maybe LNG can win if Gala gets Kaisa every single game for the entirety of playoffs. See it. All right. Well, I guess we'll see. Time will tell. We'll also have half of this bracket already knocked on out by the time that we have the next power spike. So we'll check back on in with the LPL playoff gauntlet uh, next week. Y'all, that does it for all of our segments except our last one. Time for the certified banger of the week. We stay in the LPO. It's OMG versus EDG, the palate cleanser. <laughs> All right. Before we get into this, I do have a I do have a, a couple of announcements for you guys. One of which is LFN's match of the week is going to be KT versus Gen G, just going to be potentially the battle for first place in the entire split in LCK. So if you're on eSports bet, that means you get an additional 10% winnings on that match. If you use the referral code below, up to $100 USDT, or it's equivalent to another cryptocurrency, and only on your first wager, obviously, there. So very good, especially these odds, because again, it's time for wacky LCK odds, guys. As of right now, KT is 3.009 3.009 to win this game. And they might be the favorites. Okay. It's definitely closer than that T1 KT game in terms of who's going to win this one, uh, where I thought KT was a clear favorite and had odds over three. But if you think this is 50 50, having KT at 3.009 is just fucking ridiculous. So time to ride the KT train, guys. Also, low key, if you're if you're a T1 hater like Dom, you can get 2.204 on Hanwa this week. So that's an exciting one, too. 
Yeah, I mean, T T one has got to be one of the best teams in the world to bet against consistently oh, because great. their odds are always like so inflated. Like, I mean, they uh, the craziest one was obviously that one that we always reference back in spring where they were down, they were down two zero in the series and they were three point zero odds. So think about this: KT to go into a series that, that where they might be the favorite is three point zero odds to win. When T one was down two zero to Gen G, they were three point zero odds to come back and reverse sweep like what the fuck like that's crazy i mean how often do we see reverse sweeps compared to just like actual sweeps like obviously reverse sweeps are super memorable but it's not something that happens frequently um so yeah that is just absolutely mind-blowing to me also also here's another fun one for you dom breon is at 3.075 versus t1 and that is a very winnable series for breon because breon's a lot better than their record shows and you know they took out Guangdong this week they played okay, a respectable bro. series against Tanma Life. They won a game. Okay, bro. Okay, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, it's time to, you know, I, I, I have to say, I didn't, say? I, I didn't see this OMG versus EDG series that Dom is about to regale us with. Um, but if you guys also haven't seen it like me, now's a great time for you to bust out your freeze pipe, relax, <laughs> and watch OMG. Uh, you know, you can go use your promo code at www.thefreezepipe.com. Use the promo code LFN, 10% off your entire order. It's a great time. And of course, the freeze pipe, their unique quality is that they have the food safe glycerin chamber. So you can pop off the top here. I got one right here. Pop off the top for us, Monty. There you go. Just take this off, chuck it in your freezer for an hour, cools the smoke by over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So there you go. If you're going to watch OMG versus EDG, now's a great time to put that in the freezer and then an hour, you watch the match. Chill out. OMG's got to be one of the best teams to watch off the freeze pipe. I must say, like, <laughs> they, they are so fucking cool. Like, there's some times where I'll just like kick back and watch like a, a fight from them and you'll see the way they'll play like a 4v5 there's some things that OMG does that are, it's just not teachable. You know, like the way that they'll just all <laughs> play together, the synergy, it's just so nice to watch. So, I mean, I, I, fu I fuck with that idea for sure, Monty. And this series, you can see OMG the face of God when you watch them play, you know? Yeah, really you takes know, you to the next level of understanding of League of Legends. You'll be like, is that God? Oh, wait, never mind. That's just cream. Like, they, they look the same to me. <laughs> like, but, uh, I mean, I think that this series of EDG versus OMG, it was actually a pretty well-fought series. I felt like EDG came in with some pretty good plans. For example, one of the lanes they ended up playing is the um, Ashheimer, which was then countered by the Milio Tristana coming out from OMG. And this series, the reason I liked it a lot is as an OMG fan, I got to see a lot of their adaptations and ways that they have um, figured out how to play on this patch. Removal of Renekton, playing Cassante um, for Shanji again in matchups where he's not just getting pushed in 24-7. Uh, Cream now has the ability to play Nico. He plays Nico in game three, um, and it's just like he's finding multi-man ults pretty much every single time. And you're starting to see like OMG's mastery of the patch come back in, whereas before... Um, it felt like they were kind of just playing the meta and when OMG plays what everyone else plays, I don't think they're anything special. What makes this team special is their ability to, you know, play things like the Kiana, play things like Akali, Silas. I mean, Cream might be one of the best Silas players in the entire world at this point. Like other people will play it um, every now and then in super good situations, but he can still play it in bad situations and, you know, just be top tier the way that he team fights the way that he finds engaged it's like something that you've never seen before so i really like the series i like seeing um the draft dynamics come in where you know edg was counterpicking some lanes and then omg made use of their counterpicks as well which is different than a lot of the other games you see where teams are just drafting strong champions and they don't really care how they interact with the enemy champions it's kind of like we got like this many ops you got that many ops and we just put it together and whoever has more ops wins it didn't feel like this the series it felt like there was actually some thinking behind like okay like we're gonna drop this pick but then we have like these amount of counter picks and like it, just the way that the the games progressed it was pretty nice to watch um so yeah i, I really like that series also, also um Oh, continue. Yeah, go for it. What were you oh, say? I was going to say we have to. We ha we did give a shout out to D plus versus T one earlier, so we should probably talk about that because I know you'll you'll want to discuss Popey. But yes, if you have other stuff about EDG versus OMG, go. No, I mean I, I think that, that that's pretty much it. I just think that it was it was good to see like 
another LPL series where you get these middle of the pack teams that are producing absolute bangers, just tons of team fights. And the difference that you notice is like, so when I watch LCS, Gilius actually put this in my mind. When you watch LCS, what happens is you have two teams running in circles. And then the guy that has the biggest balls on the day, he engages. And then that team just like wins 5 for 0 and they just like end the game. <laughs> like that, that's pretty much how an LCS situation <laughs> happens. Whereas like in LPL, one of the things that I love about OMG is like they'll have maybe two people die early on in a team fight, but the enemy team will use major abilities and they'll be in a 3v5. And if you look at the last fight that you get in this game, it's one of those where Cream goes in with, with an ego. He gets like a three man ult, dies for it. Enemy team uses cooldowns, flashes to get away. And then Shanji dies as well. And because they know so many cooldowns are down, Abel just goes in and they clean them up just 3v5. It's like not even a close fight afterwards. And I love seeing people play on the edge and track more than just like, how many people do we have alive? Because it seems like a lot of teams are very willing to like disengage a fight when they think it's like losing. They're like, oh, we lost a couple members. It's not going well. Let's like back off. It feels like OMG and, and teams in LPL in general are good at fighting through those situations, like recognizing like, yeah, I mean, maybe these two guys died, but that guy used flash. This guy used his like Jaxi or something. And now we have a window to, to engage. So I really like seeing that out of um, these games. And there was a lot of these situations, like just a bunch of banger team fights. Um, and that's probably the thing I like most about League of Legends, which is why I like the LPL so much. But yeah, let's talk about uh, Dom on T1. <laughs> we just we 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 did a shout out to it earlier, so I wanted to to wrap on that note because sure. uh, T1 at least they the rest of the players well maybe maybe not owner but the rest of the players who were not owner at least Zayas looked like he could lane again, which he didn't look like he could do last week. Uh, Poby though. He, he, he's putting on his best faker cosplay right now, just like playing Annie and, and Azir every game. But unlike faker, he can't hide on Bush and he just walks out into the open on Annie and then gets caught by Deft, who uses Gale Force and explodes him. And uh, then the game just ends. Then the game yeah. just ends. No, I thought it was really great because I was nervous that T1 might actually like win. And <laughs> honestly, Poby is doing God's work. Like if I was off the free pipe, maybe I would think he's God. I was like, oh man, like, can we have some divine intervention? And then I just see Poby walk into the full enemy team. I'm like, that's what I was looking for. It was perfect. Jeez, man. So uh, no, I mean, I think, I think Poby like these. So the earlier games, it felt like the team was underperforming. These games actually feel like you could be like, oh, with Faker, they just win. You know, like Faker yes. being in, they're going to win these games. Like Poby was the reason they lost um, this series to Dalmont. That being said, I mean, Dalmont still looks ugly. They've looked, uh, I've, I've checked in. I don't watch every single Dalmont game, but I check in with them like maybe like every week, every two weeks. Like I'll just like watch them be like, are they still shit? And even this series, man, like the way that they ended game number two, that was fucking painful. You have two inhibs down, then you somehow like end up in a fight at Nexus turrets. You all die. Like then you have another one where you have like elder, you try to dive the Nexus turrets and you all die again. Like it was, it was one of those solo queue games where you're like, please just group up, group up, use the waves and end the game like normal people. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about D plus is they're trying to address some of these issues, Dom. I mean, that's why Bible is in is because ostensibly, Bible is better at engaged champs and also provides a lot of late game shot calling. And he's a, he's a, you know, he talks all the time in these games, but he's also still a very new player. He's only had a few games at the LCK level under his belt. <laughs> and you can certainly see that in, in this series because he doesn't even know when he can die a lot of the time, which is true of Poby as well. And it was true of Pace in spring. It takes time for players to, understand what top tier teams can do to them if you slightly misposition because he started in this game and just got clapped by Guma Yushi and Karia in game one at like level one ended up dying on Melio to an all in that he refused to flash. Um and then you get into you know the 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 rest of the series and it, it looks a little bit better. But if you're gonna take the weakness of his potential individual play and positioning, you need to buttress it with good late game shot calling but it didn't look like that was really happening in game two because they had a huge lead for most of the game and it just took forever to close it out yeah i wanted the game to be over at like 27 minutes it was yes. incredible to me that the game <laughs> I, kept on dragging on when, when i was watching the vod of that game i was like i was looking at it it was like 25 minutes in i'm like why is this game 40 minutes long <laughs> And yeah. I just like fast forward. I was like, what's what goes on? What what shenanigans are happening? Why is this guy? And I was like, oh, they're just terrible at closing. Okay. Yeah. And, and in the case of Poby here, 
you never want to be the guy replacing the legend. You want to be the guy like afterwards <laughs> replacing the legend. You know, and and the weird thing with T1 is they have another position where that also isn't true. They've had stability at the AD carry role for a for as long as T1's been a thing. It went from Piglet to Bang, and then from Bang to Teddy. Teddy was probably the most unstable one, but then they went to Gumiyushi. They've had relatively stable there uh, in that role, but now Poby is part of a long list, a long list of mid laners that have played substitute or behind Faker, and you know. Um, We'll see how the rest of his story gets uh, played out. Like uh, good old Phoenix One Pyrian. I just wanted to throw out Pyrian reference there. <laughs> About Scout and Easy Hoon. Yeah. yeah, I know. Easy Hoon, Easy Hoon's, <laughs> Easy Hoon played really well during his time over there. Scout didn't play very well during his time at T1. And then didn't hardly now, play at all. Brilliant. He's uh, yeah. over there. Had a brilliant career over at the LPL. So, um, all right. Cool. There you have it. Uh, some of our bangers of the week. Make sure to go check them out. D plus T1 and our uh, match OMG versus EDG. This was a very full episode, y'all. It was a good one. <laughs> it was fun. Welcome back, LEC. That that You came back right at the right time and gave us some interesting storylines. Excel on in. Thanks to everyone at home that watched and supported. Please make sure to like and subscribe our videos and comment. As per usual, where will people find you this week? Monty. Uh, I am going to be on 1 million shows again so be sure to check out the last free nation culture channel doing a lot of stuff over there that's i've been really enjoying making as we start to grow that so start to do lfn non-esports stuff guys if you like the esports content the non-esports content is good too boom Dumb. can i flame t1 in the non-esports content uh can you find like a t1 equivalent in sports that is there a t1 equivalent in sports for you Maybe like the Lakers or something. There you go. That's a good pick one. Any, pick any of the <laughs> dynasty ones. Lakers, the, the Yankees. current Patriots. <laughs> Yankees right now. Yeah, suck but Patriots too. are like Patriots are just too like not real right now. You know, like Lakers at least still have LeBron and like AD and they're supposed to be good and people were trying to make it seem like they were gonna beat the Nuggets and like, you know, in the in the Western Conference finals. So uh, I I'll just flame the Lakers. LeBron will be my faker. <laughs> oh boy all I right well you can get all that content over at our lfn sports channel and make sure to check out all of them and you can see how are your in interviews the chat in the you did like a million interviews last week got yeah right. we had a million interviews two weeks ago last week uh i hosted the mobile esports awards the mobies and then i hosted a uh a, an con a, a influencer event a crypto gaming influencer event with uh, Quincy, uh, Quincy Rampage Jackson, UFC legend, and oh, okay. and Steve Urkel, uh, the actor that played Steve Urkel, Jaleel White, super. Did they, fight? <laughs> they fake fought. They were super funny, uh, <laughs> as well as uh, two Filipina um, artists and superstars, Yasi Pressman and the singer of Neon's Neon's uh, Valorant song, Ilona Garcia. She's super cool. They're both super cool. And then Alex Wasabi and Guava Juice that are also YouTubers, very famous YouTubers. Alex Wasabi is a 2-0 and o fighter in like the, the, the content creator boxing series. It was a very weird mashup of people and we were there to play some games. It was a lot of fun. Um, this week, I got very long interviews with Huhi, Treats, your boy Treats, and uh, Mithy. So those are the three ones I was able to sneak on in with my one day at LCS. I'll be there all three days. So I'll be there as teams make playoffs, get eliminated from playoffs. Um, yeah, when it's going to be uh, a very when emotional is, day. How long till Treats is back on your, your stream, Dom? Uh, is, it all, is the pain almost over? When is Worlds? When is Worlds then? Because <laughs> they also need to win three games just like FlyQuest, right? So... Who yeah, knows? maybe they can do the miracle run. I, I think actually, they have wonder, an easier path. Yeah, actually, they might actually have an easier path. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Let me see. How is their matchup versus uh, Hunter Thieves? Right, they're even. They're one and one with Hunter Thieves, I believe. Uh, yeah, they're one yeah, and they're one, one with Hunter Thieves. They're and one, one and zero oh against Energy. Thieves. They're two oh. and zero oh against Dignitas. They have the tiebreakers against all the teams that they need to catch. Well, I guess Energy's there, so they have the tiebreaker with Hunter Thieves and Dignitas. So. FlyQuest is wow. the only team, and they get to play later. So actually, we've been looking at it from a lens like, will FlyQuest make it? We should probably be looking at it. Will Immortals make it? They might be able to sneak on in. So Yeah, uh, with how EG looked last week, maybe they're just complete frauds. Who knows? Yeah, EG 
FlyQuest and Immortal uh, uh, Energy on the table here for Immortals. So we'll see. You know, we'll see how that happens. But uh, yeah, uh, I'll have interviews with all the teams coming up this week, and then we'll get into playoffs. So sweet. Uh, thank you again to all of our partners for making Power Spike happen. We'll catch you guys next week for all the tears, everything but the crime. See you later. <laughs>